Hello and welcome to Acupunch Professional. I'm here with Peter Dedman, who is the author of this fabulous new book, Live Well, Live Long, Teaching from the Chinese Nourishment of Life Tradition. So Peter, thank you so much for joining us today and I'd love to hear from you. What inspired you to go and write this book? Um, well, to be honest, it sounds a bit grand, but this, this book is kind of the fruit of uh, a lifetime's work. I mean, my first work really was setting up a natural foods company, which I was drawn into because of uh, experiencing sickness in my early 20s. I had a very bad case of hepatitis following some very enjoyable hippie lifetime traveling kind of thing. Uh, but I was pretty sick, and at that time I came across um, the microbiotic diet, which basically was about diet and lifestyle as a tool to maintain and restore health. And that was my first enthusiasm. So I worked with the natural foods business for a number of years. And then, um, because macrobiotics was based on principles of, well, actually Japanese, but East Asian medicine, I got drawn more and more to the medical side and to the philosophical and theoretical side, and I got into Chinese medicine. And my study of Chinese medicine was very much influenced in the early, late 80s by um, a guy called Dr. John Shen, who was an elderly Taiwanese doctor, who always asked himself, with every single patient, why is this person ill? So what is, what is the cause of disease? Disease is not just a random thing, but it comes for often definable causes, not always. So that interested me very much, and that was the lens through which I viewed my patients for 30 years, and also because of my own continuing need for various reasons to look after my own health, I became, so I maintained my interest in diet, I became uh, a fairly passionate practitioner of Qigong, and I slowly really became aware that there was this, as well as within the Chinese medical tradition, as well as the branches of acupuncture, of herbal medicine, of Tuina massage, there was this other wonderful area called Yang Xiang, Nourishment of Life. And um, I started researching and started um, presenting short two or three hour lectures on it. And those grew to a day and then they grew to a weekend. and then they grew beyond a weekend, and I suddenly real, realized I had a lot of material. And there was one other reason, actually, which is um, after I gave up practice, one of the things I did was uh, go into creative writing. And I wrote some short stories, quite had some quite good success with that, and then I decided to write a novel without quite knowing what I was doing, and I wrote a quite a long novel for young adults. And... Um, Whilst it had some, certainly some very good things about it, there was something I knew fundamentally wrong. And I was finally illuminated by somebody that I had to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, I was so daunted by the prospect. I did what a lot of people do with uh, first novels. I put it away in a drawer. I thought, I'll do something else. And, and that something else was write this book, Live Well, Live Long. And I'm really glad I did. Um, it was a delaying tactic, partly, but <laughs> I've obviously got completely absorbed in it and now it's something I feel very passionately about. Indeed, so you're saying it's a lifetime collection of your personal journey and your teachings, but really it was just a procrastination <laughs> from, a, from another project, which I, I assume is yeah, going to be your next project. I don't know. But I, I should say, uh, yeah, reflection of my lifetime interest, uh, my teaching, my, my experience as a practitioner, but the last two years, a considerable amount of research. I paid many visits to the British, wonderful British Library. Um, I investigated, so I investigated a lot of translated sources from the Chinese. I don't speak Chinese, but there's all this wonderful source material out there. And also, the book is uh, packed, some people might say overpacked, with um, research evidence because this book is. Uh, I've tried, and this may be a strength, it may perhaps be a weakness, but I've tried to write a book that will be meaningful and appeal to the widest possible audience. So for um, Chinese medicine students and practitioners, first of all, 
uh, I want to deepen their understanding of the nourishment of life tradition for their own sake and for the sake of their patients. And, oh, excuse me. Is that okay? Hello? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's fine. So are you just saying Chinese medicine students and, and for patients? Um, yeah, I, I was also for Chinese medicine students and practitioners, I wanted to um, show them and reassure them that this tradition that we practice, particularly the health cultivation aspect of it, is, has been powerfully confirmed by lifestyle research over the last 20 or 25 years. Uh, pretty much everything that has been said about maintaining health and curing disease through lifestyle practices has been backed up now. And this provides a very, very solid base for this wisdom of Chinese medicine. Because as we know, in the field of so-called alternative and complementary medicine, people just say stuff. You know, they, they say, they throw ideas out there and theories and beliefs because they like them, because they're appealing, and people love hearing them, particularly if they're attractive ideas. Um, we believe a whole, or we risk believing a whole lot of stuff that uh, perhaps doesn't have any evidence and doesn't have any greater value than it, that it sounds good. So it's very important to me to, in this book, to demonstrate that these ideas have, should we say, confirmatory backing. I mean, Research is not the only thing that backs up the value of these ideas. Of course, traditional wisdom and the time factor. I mean, Chinese um, medical teachings and health teachings have this unique uh, status in that they have a fairly uninterrupted 2,000, 2,500 year history. And that's a hell of a lot of time to test and refine and prove and evaluate these ideas. So... Um, their validation comes both from the, from the tradition and from research. So that's really the value of what I hope the book will be for practitioners and students. But I have a wider audience in mind. Um, the second group uh, of people I would love to read this book is other medical practitioners, not Chinese medicine. So that would include complementary medical practice, practitioners and orthodox medical practitioners. Um, because, first of all, I think that they fail to understand the depth of wisdom within the Chinese tradition, and hopefully this will increase their respect for it. And, and also, we have in the Chinese tradition something which is badly needed nowadays. I mean, we're all interested in health, we're all interested in diet and exercise and so on. But it tends to, we tend to be assaulted with lots of contradictory ideas and lots of kind of random bits of information and what you find I think, well, what I found in the young Sheng tradition is a kind of joined up process, a whole view of human life um, from birth to death, every aspect of human life. So whereas we might read fascinating research about diet and people may be, become obsessed with diet, they may ignore uh, the their emotional and mental state. Uh, some people are very spiritual and focus on their mental and emotional state when they don't exercise their body. Some people eat well and exercise well but don't get enough sleep or have reckless sex lives or, and so on. So this is a kind of really joined up approach that is uh, derived from and it is seamlessly interwoven with um, a few core principles, common sense core principles that help us make they provide clarity and help us make sense of this information. And those principles include things such as um, follow nature, that's the contribution of Taoism, observe nature and follow the natural way wherever possible. That's a very, very powerful idea when it comes to looking at how we eat, um, how we uh, organize childbirth, how we exercise our bodies and so on. Second thing is harmony, harmony of yin and yang, uh, which has multiple ramifications through the whole tradition um, in exercise. We, perfect exercise combines 
development of strength, the development of relaxation and softness, for example. We balance the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so yin and yang has, has really seamlessly interwoven in this tradition. And an, uh, another really key idea is free flow. Um, free flow of qi and blood, we say in Chinese medicine, but in Western medicine really there's a similar concept, which is free flow of blood through vasodilation and, and effective microcirculation. So the things that we know provoke, promote free flow in qi and blood, which is almost a definition of health, are very much lifestyle things. Um, exercising, being happy, drinking tea, having enjoyable sex, dancing, all these things enhance free flow. And also we know from Western medicine, those are the things that promote maximum blood flow to the body, which is understood increasingly to be um, a key part of good health. And perhaps finally, because clearly you've probably realized by now I could talk on this for a long time. Um, and another interesting idea, I think probably the last one, key idea I mentioned, is um, stopping before completion. There's something about the Western mind um, Western culture that loves a certain kind of level of extremism. We love extreme emotion. We want to fall madly in love. We're attracted to um, exercise that causes us to pour sweat and reach the point of exhaustion. We, we're attracted to, uh, well, so slightly complex, but we're, we're attracted to sexual activity that reaches sort of maximum orgasms and things like this. In the, in the Chinese tradition and in the nourishment of life tradition, we have this idea of kind of stopping before completion. So we eat until we're 70% full. We exercise, but we stop before the point of exhaustion so that... Um, during the rest of our day, we feel vibrant and active, not exhausted and tired. The optimum level of exercise is one where we see a three flights of stairs and we feel like walking or even running up them. We think, oh, I could drive into town, but actually my body feels like walking. So um, in actually in bodily movement, if you look at the internal Chinese uh, body arts, which I think are some of the finest systems of exercise human beings have come up with, we never stretch to maximum 100%. We always stop before completion. And we now discover that by this lengthening to 70 or 80% and then drawing back, what we're doing actually is uh, the perfect exercise for maximizing flexibility and fashion, which is almost a definition of a youthful body. So um, we have these core principles that I think are really valuable to be understood by other health professionals, orthodox medicine and, com and complementary medicine. And finally, um, I have written the book, ideally, it is a bit academic and every chapter ends with two or three hundred references, so it's not necessarily everybody's cup of tea, but it is written for everybody. And so any Chinese medicine content, which is not a great deal, any Chinese medicine theory, I've tried to explain in a way that any moderately um, intelligent reader can understand. So I'm being ambitious. That this, I feel that this tradition has a great deal to offer the world. And um, shall I just carry on? Do you I have Please, some more? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, there's Chinese uh, culture is full of wonderful sayings, which you know have great meaning. And one of them is, um, "Before the age of thirty, we bully disease, and after the age of thirty, disease bullies us." So there's this you know idea that by and large, if we're born reasonably healthy, we can sort of motor on with our um, innate health till we reach a certain age and then bits start to drop off the car unless we, unless we take notice and look after ourselves. Well, I would say that the modern world, we are all seriously bullied by disease. Um, we're looking at true epidemics of chronic disease. And this is fairly new. Remember, 
for most of human history, people died of infectious diseases. And they have not, absolutely, but they've to, ver to various degrees been conquered. What we have now is lifestyle diseases. And it's very, very clear the more, the more that Western lifestyles move into the so-called developing world, the more they bring in their weight, this epidemic of uh, cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, diabetes, uh, dementia, early strokes, and depression. And um, if that's not bad enough, and it is bad if you're sitting in the health ministry of any government in the world paying attention, you're inevitably very, very anxious about this because no society can afford to provide the medical treatment that we expect to this level of disease. So this is actually a crisis. But there are other crises too which compound that and they are uh, environmental. So um, The Lancet said, I can't remember, two or three years ago, published a paper saying that climate change was, was one of the greatest threats to human health in terms of changing disease patterns and, and, and the spread of disease. And of course, we, we face all kinds of health challenges in the environment in terms of um, compromised air quality, compromised water quality, um, pesticides in food, degraded soils, and so on. And these are not abstract. These present real dangers to human well-being and health. And so um, a philosophy of health that... Uh, embraces certain core ideas like, let's take just one, the, the Taoist teaching really that we are an inseparable part of nature. We find in the Judeo-Christian tradition from the Bible, I'm not so sure about other religions such as Islam, but we find the idea that, that uh, man is the ruler, man has dominion over the, the earth and everything that lives on it and we have behaved for uh, a long time now as though we have dominion over the earth and, and we have caused immense and possibly irreversible damage. So the idea that we are seamlessly part of everything that is, neither not different from, not more important than, is actually, um, and that we respect and follow nature, that is a really powerful idea that the world needs at the moment. So what was your question? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely entranced and I'm sort of you're thinking about raising young kids into this world and how to, um, to best mitigate some of those things that you've talked about. But my question was, you know, given that the book is this combination of your lifetime experience from both being a practitioner and also putting this into practice yourself and, and from teaching others, and your then days at the British Library to research this, did anything surprise you? Was there anything that you, any belief system that you had that when it actually came down to the looking for the evidence, it didn't match up. Because, you know, it's just, just wondering whether that experience for you was just confirmation of everything you already knew, or there was one thing or a couple of things that were enlightening in that process. Um, two, things, two things come to mind. One I've already mentioned, which is um, a kind of almost constant sense of awe at how spot on most of this tradition was. And sometimes you just find... A brief statement. Um, I mean, just to take one example, um, Sun Tzu Miao, as many, a 7th century, great 7th century doctor, as many uh, writings before him said we should learn to exercise the body by following nature, flowing water never becomes stagnant, leather door hinges never get eaten by insects because they're always moving. So he said the way of nurturing life is to just to keep moving but never exhaust yourself. He said, don't stand too long, don't sit too long, and don't lie down too long. Now those are very, very simple statements, but what do we find at the cutting edge now of exercise research? We find actually it's not so much about the hour in the gym you do every day, it's about the whole um, balance of your daily activity. And it is healthier to not do vigorous exercise in the gym for an hour. I'm not saying that's not good, but it's actually healthier. It's even better than that to have a lifestyle where you just keep moving all the time um, 
and keep your body flowing, if you like, like flowing water, uh, never taking it to an extreme. Um, standing up during the day, so now we have people understand we have standing desks, but not standing too long, because we now know you stand too long, you start to get muscular skeletal problems, you sit down too long, um, you are increased risk of cardiovascular disease and so on. So a very simple idea laid down actually earlier in the 7th century is really only now being understood. So that's one thing, this kind of constant surprise. Wow, they, they really hit the nail on the head. But the other, I suppose, the most difficult chapter to write, and I, I presume this is mainly going out to Chinese medicine practitioners, is that right? Uh, yes, this will go out to active yes, professional yes. members, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, is, is, was the sex chapter. I mean, sex is always difficult to write about. We even have a, in, in Britain, we have a bad sex literary award where people are hauled in front of an audience and ridiculed for their awful writing about sex. But, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't writing about sex in that way. But a difficult chapter to write for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I think the, the, it was the one area where the traditional Taoist and Chinese medical teachers diverge most widely from modern thinking, that's really about um, male ejaculation. So we know that in the Chinese tradition, uh, seminal fluid is a manifestation of qing, and that excessive ejaculation depletes qing and ages men before their time. And uh, I, I have to say this is a, you know, a largely male-centric tradition, although I did discover some quite interesting stuff about um, females. The female sexual tradition, which was great, to sort of balance it out, um, and, and that's simply not recognised at all in Western medicine. I mean, all the thinking at the moment is, you know, the more sex you have and the more ejaculation men have, the better for prostate health and so on. I think, I'm not sure that that's going to stay like that, but it's one thing where I really found that all I could do was say, well, the tradition says this, and this is what the latest research appears to be showing and they don't they don't really meet so that that was the trickiest area mm. and it's interesting too you know one of the other chapters which caught my eye um was the chapter about it's actually just in the appendices about detoxification and you know that idea that yeah. you say in your book that you know open up any magazine or turn the tv on everything's around this sort of detox um, lifestyle and, and you know I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more you know, given you just described the traditional Chinese view of sex and how it applies in a modern world, whether there's discord between our modern understanding of, of the detoxification kind of fad and, and how that relates to the classics. Yeah, it is a difficult area. I and mean, It's actually something I'd like to research more. I mean, inevitably, ideas about health and sickness relate to culture. And we know that. I mean, even, you know, the language of medicine, I mean, 19th century medicine was the body as machine, 20th century medicine was the body as a, a site of warfare with magic bullets and drugs which attack disease, 21st century medicine is, uh, I'm talking about orthodox medicine, is sort of about information technology and, uh, and so on. So, and, and ancient Chinese medicine was about managing water flow and rivers and streams and wells and reservoirs and dikes and seas and floods because that was the predominant technology of their time. So all medicine is rooted in culture. So if you've come across a, a theme that keeps reappearing, you have to also look for its cultural roots. So detox is an idea that's taken for granted. You know, everybody's, oh yeah, I don't know. I'm going to detox and you know, detox diets and detox wraps and detox retreats and all that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I wanted to go a bit deeper than that because I'm pretty suspicious about the idea. And it's quite interesting that in certain religious traditions, so certainly the Judeo-Christian tradition and also in the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, the body is basically pretty foul. It's dirty, it keeps getting polluted, um, and there's a kind of distaste for the body, and it's something to be escaped. That affects our whole spiritual tradition. I mean, spiritual development in, in even the word spiritual means uh, promoting a certain aspect of the human 
being, the soul or the spirit, and separating it off from the heavy, earthbound, dirty, polluted body so that we can ascend immaterially towards heaven. And that's an idea that even seeps through into New Age spiritualism unquestionedly. Um, and, as I say, Hindu, Hindu and Buddhist tradition, we see very much in the Hindu caste system, a kind of absolute abhorrence of pollution and dirt and yogic practices of cleansing the toxic body and so on. Um, and within the Taoist tradition, and I did check this out when I was in Rottenburg, I asked Michael Stanley Baker, who's the person I know who knows most about Taoism, you know, I wanted confirmation of my perspective that actually Taoism doesn't look at the body like that. Like Taoism looks at the body as a kind of beautiful landscape uh, full of precious treasures, full of qi and ding and body fluids and that these are cultivated and we don't want to kind of constantly eject them from the body. We don't want to sweat it out and shit it out and piss it out. No, we want to preserve and protect and nourish the body. And to me, this is a much more attractive and wholesome idea. And I do therefore think that the, the core ideas of detoxification are based on both the idea that the body is fundamentally dirty and needs a regular good seeing to it. And, you know, it's not so long ago, every kid in Britain was fed castor oil in the morning to, you know, as a laxative to kind of get out the dirt of the body. Uh, but it's also very much associated with guilt, guilt about physicality and guilt about the needs and desires and wants of the physical body. So people often resort to the idea of detoxing after they feel guilty about overindulgence. You know, oh, I've been drinking a lot and I've been eating too much chocolate, so now I'm going to kind of castigate myself. And this is really, on some level, no different than the ancient Christian medieval idea of fasting and flagellation and wearing a hair shirt. It's not that the idea is completely wrong, it's the framing of it. And I feel that we have a much healthier, within Chinese medicine, much healthier view of balance, harmony, uh, adjusting ourselves to the flow of yin and yang. Maybe we've been eating too much, uh, drinking too much alcohol and eating too much rich and spicy food. So we've developed internal heat. So, so to rebalance ourselves, we reduce amount, the amount of heat-producing foods and we take more cooling foods, but it's not really an idea of dirt and toxicity. So that's really what I was uh, addressing in that section, that appendix on detoxification. Mm. And as you say, I think it's a whole area that warrants perhaps further investigation, particularly, you know, and you allude to this in that brief chapter, is, uh, so the brief appendices about the commercialisation of health. And one thing I'm hearing, which is really interesting, you're talking about everything in moderation, uh, in nothing in excess, and, and something like a, a detoxification model is terrific because the counterbalance to that is go and buy all these products to force this detox detoxification. So it's really the commercialization of that model of understanding health. So, you know, it's, it's interesting within the Peter Dedman um, Live Long, Live Well model, it doesn't seem to be much commercialization available. It seems to be that... Um, that this is it, that uh, there's, no, there's no silver bullet, there's no, you know, what would you describe as being the one thing that, that if you could give advice to all of your patients that you've ever seen or all of the patients of the acupuncturists watching today, what would be the okay. advice for them? Okay, well, I, I'm not saying advice, but it's just popped in mind, I've come up with two, uh, one a quotation, one a story from the book, so the quotation is from a 19th century doctor called Fable Xiong, whom uh, Volker Scheid has written about at length. And he said something which I think addresses what you just said, um, very spot on. He said, um, there is nothing miraculous in the world, there's only the plane, or the ordinary, but the perfection of the plane is miraculous. So it's not about kind of miracle solutions and expensive foods and superfoods and intense detoxes and twice the price gluten-free foods and it's just about getting really good at managing the very ordinary business of eating, exercising, breathing, looking after our mind and emotions, sleeping well and so on. There's not a lot of money to be made out of any of this. Uh, 
that's one thing. And the other thing is um, a story I, I heard once, and I used to tell my patients. So because of my interest in lifestyle, I often used to talk to patients about lifestyle and make suggestions, which I learned is, can be a double-edged weapon when you suggest something about you know, let's suppose somebody came with a chronic back pain and I'd say, well, treatment can only get you so far, but you really need to mobilize and strengthen your back. So um, I'll try times and then why don't you go and take up some yoga or some Tai Chi or something. And, and then perhaps they'd contact me after a few weeks of yoga and Tai Chi and say, um, it's not better yet. You know, uh, <laughs> I've had this back problem for 30 years and I've been doing yoga for two weeks and it hasn't cured it. So I had to tell them the story of the American tourist who goes to the Tower of London, which was built in the 12th century, and he sees this, um, there's a bowling green there, a piece of the most beautiful grass he's ever seen in, in his life. Bright, brilliant, verdant green in the, in the sunshine, every leaf perfectly cropped, absolutely flat as a billiard table. And an old man pulling a heavy roller across it. And he says to this guy, he says, gee, you must tell me, how do you get a piece of grass looking like this? And, and the guy says, well, it's very easy. So you just water it regularly and roll it every day for 800 years. So um, it's a kind of slight joke about Amer the shortness of American history. But it's basically about you do what is, you, you follow simple, straightforward health practice like eating well, it's not an extreme thing, it's not a detox diet you do for two weeks thinking about, oh God, I'm looking forward to this finishing so I can go back to whatever. It's just a way of eating, it's a way of exercising, it's a way of living that is harmonious, it's easy to follow, um, it's enjoyable and you just keep doing it, you just keep going along and after 800 years... <laughs> You're, you're perfect. No, you're not. You, I, die. you die. That's, <laughs> that's, no, that is, a, I haven't got to that chapter. That's the end of the book. No, I'm going to just say one last thing. No, no, I've got another question for you before you do. So you say your last thing, and I, then I get to ask my last question. My last thing is it is important to understand. Um, this is obvious, but we have problem getting this into our thick heads. Is however well we look after ourselves and we can extend our healthy life well into old age. That's the ideal of young Chang Chinese culture, be a healthy, old, healthy, fit, strong older person. We will inevitably decline. All our physical functions will decline, our mobility, our vision, our hearing, <laughs> our appetite, our digestion, our libido. Everything is going downhill, and then we're going to die, which is a challenging prospect very challenging prospect for humans. We have intelligence and we can, if you think about it, we can see that future and especially challenging if we don't believe in any kind of afterlife. So um, however well we look after ourselves, that's going to happen. And so part of looking after ourselves, cultivating ourselves, is a really key part. Almost the first part is cultivating our mind and, and emotions and if you like, I don't like to use that word, our spirit. Um, because, first of all, without cultivating um, positive qualities such as friendship, generosity, compassion, kindness, the search for health can become very narcissistic. Um, the Nazis were big into natural lifestyles and healthy food and, and deep breathing and all that kind of thing. They weren't a very good advertisement for it. Uh, but the second thing is it's only through the cultivation of uh, wisdom, which requires a lifelong commitment to learning, paying attention, being flexible in our thinking, only we, uh, we, and, and, for, and philosophy, can we really reach a point where if we're lucky enough to live a long life, when we approach death as a kind of, uh, with matured wisdom and with the ability to under, understand and accept death as an inevitable part of the process of living. We've been gifted, if you like, this incredible thing, life. There was untold time that we weren't alive and we were alive for this brief flash of time and there will be untold time 
that we're not alive and to somehow uh, be able to accept that and understand it and come to peace with it, that is the, um, the requirement to, be, to have developed wisdom. So that's my last bit. Mm. Well, it's, it, it's, it's, well, it seems like such a fitting note to end on, but I do have a question for you. And, and that is that, you know, we've talked about um, you know, diet, we've talked about exercise, we've talked about sex, and you've talked about spiritual development. Um, one of the things which, which you know, dominates as a chapter in your book is actually the use of tea. And I thought, just to, because I know that's something you're super passionate about, and it's not something, that's right, it's not something that you actually, um, across other spectrums, and certainly in, in Western health, it's not covered at all. I think it's very unique to a Chinese or traditional understanding of health. So I just wanted to elicit from you, you know, your relationship with tea and your relationship with that for, I, I'm also thinking of acupuncturists watching today, things that they can introduce into their practice to give, you know, added value to what they're doing, offering their patients. And if, by giving dietary advice and exercise advice, but also giving them advice around the consumption of tea. Yeah, well, the Chinese tradition and the Japanese tradition has always said tea is the healthiest of all drinks, it's essential for good health, uh, life is inconceivable without it, and so on. And you say this is not part of the Western tradition, it is now. I mean, there's been masses of research into tea in the last decade or two, and the overwhelming conclusion, now without the shadow of a doubt, is tea is the single healthiest liquid that human beings can drink, healthier than water, healthier than any other type of herbal tea, and so on. But tea, for some reason, you know, um, why, we don't know, benefits pretty much every cell in the body and every organ in the body, and it's very, very pleasant as well. So I think um, patients have probably heard green tea is good for them. In fact, it seems all tea, because it all comes, essentially comes from the same plant. There are some differences, and black tea, we say in Chinese medicine, is warmer, hotter, but green tea is cooler, oolong teas are in between. But broadly, it's the same plant, Camellia sinensis, and, and it's the plant that, that benefits us. So people do hear that green tea is pleasant, but unfortunately, uh, they then trust along to their local health food shop and buy a pack of green tea for two English pounds or three or four US dollars and drink it and think, uh, it may be good for me, but it really doesn't taste good. And that is terribly sad because uh, really tea, tea is our non-inebriating wine. I mean, we can drink tea all day long. Most of us can't drink wine all day long, but the pleasure of taste in tea, the, whole, the innumerable varieties of teas, the terroir teas, the, you know, this tea grown on this little estate, this height in this particular climate, once, our, once we get into tea and start being willing to spend more money on it and enjoy its pleasures, it's a, just a great unfolding joy um, to, to sample and enjoy all these numerous teas. So I've actually, with a, a, a tea expert friend, set up a, a very little tea company called Jade Spring Tea. To be honest, really, my motivation is just I wanted <laughs> access to access to good tea. Um, but we have um, prioritized buying teas from uh, direct from small farmers who maintain the traditional manual picking and manual tea preparation because we want to help, uh, help their livelihoods. It's the most um, uh, ethically sound way of buying tea direct from their, their producer and to help them able to keep these ancient traditions going. But anyway, as far as patience is concerned, there's no downside. The only downside really is if people suffer from insomnia. Some people are um, very sensitive to caffeine, and you have to recognize that. But actually, most people, caffeine is something that, uh, for most of us, we become very quickly adapted to, it and it doesn't negatively affect us if we drink tea regularly. But for most people, telling them, encouraging them to drink tea, to experiment with nicer kinds of tea, and, and actually selling them tea. Why not? If, you want to, if you're running a business, which most private practices are, you know, you can sell a few products, and tea is one of the nicest things to sell. Mm. 
What's interesting too, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time looking at innovative marketing strategies and one of the nice things that you can do for a patient is by giving them some tea at the end of a, a session. By taking that tea home and preparing it at home, what it's doing is reinforcing the treatment that you've given them. So it's reinforcing that relationship that you have, as well as reinforcing you know, any of the benefit, the conversations you've had. You're, you're constantly reminding your patient of your influence in their life. And so I think tea makes a wonderful gift for patients, or as you say, a product to sell in your um, acupuncture practice. Um, so, actually, well, yeah, are you saying? Well, just to say that, um, that when we get into tea drinking a bit, then um, the way that we do it tends to change. We tend to savour it and we might learn a little bit about fancy ways of making tea. And, and tea actually becomes, I mean, it already is a ritual. Tea's always been a ritual. You know, English tea, four o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know about America. You have different rit rituals. You chuck it in the sea, I believe. Um, sorry, you're not. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not, for some reason, I suddenly thought you're American. You're not. <laughs> Australian, Australian. Yeah, like, but like, yeah, I think I think Australia's adopted some of the UK traditions of drinking a cup of tea, and it's yeah. you know, it's certainly that uh, that that tea is medicinal in, as far as many people are concerned, and it's just it's just really reinforcing that. Although interesting, I think in the states, it's, it's there's a bit of a fixation around coffee and the, the other form of you know high level stimulants. But sorry, you, you were going to say that? Well, just just that returning to a kind of more uh, even minimally ritualistic way of drinking tea, which is actually that rather than um, just chucking a tea bag in a cup and yanking it around, you actually sit down and you drink tea and you share tea with friends and maybe you have a you know, nice teapot to go with it. And, and this is just a very human activity and it's a, a very relaxing and uh, pause in the day and often a social activity. So uh, there's a lot more to tea than simply it's and I like that idea of offering patients a health-preserving ritual, you know, encouraging your patients, particularly that the, the patients I see are often the caffeinated, the highly stressed, the, you know, the highly motivated. And the, the downside of that is, as you're absolutely right, there isn't enough sitting down drinking tea. And I think it's a lovely uh, piece of advice to be able to say to people is it's not just about the consumption of a liquid. It's about a, a commitment to your, yourself even if it's just a couple of minutes broken up through the day. You know, and, and I, you know, obviously I, I'm spending a lot of time working with people who want to give, give up cigarette smoking. I think the, the uh, replacement of drinking, the tea ritual, would be a really great way of um, inserting yep. that into that behaviour. So, Peter, just... I have yeah. to, well, I have to put in a plug for my book because, because um, it's not been out long. It's only been out about three weeks, but, but one practitioner um, has bought copies sell on to their patients so that you know is uh, I obviously want that um, I've spent three years writing this book I'd like some financial return on it but mu much more importantly than that really genuinely I want what I put together to go out into the world it's the best effort that I could possibly make at the moment um, to spread this information I may um, I'm hoping to get feedback in on the ways in which I might have not succeeded and then perhaps look to improving it. But at the moment, that's my best effort to offer something that I think is really, really valuable to the world. And so um, getting it out beyond the Chinese medicine community and for those practitioners who do offer things beyond treatment to their patients, this is really a viable thing to, to contribute to people's health, I think. So, well, Peter Dedman, on behalf of acupuncturists watching today and their patients and perhaps their potential patients in the future, thank you so much. I'm holding a copy up here to the camera. Live well, live long. And that is the teachings from the Chinese nourishment of life tradition. Uh, you've been listening to Acupuncture Professional with Peter Dedman and Catherine Berry. Thanks so much for taking time with us today, Peter. Welcome. Pleasure.